War and Peace, Book Thirteen, Chapter Nineteen, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. A man in motion always devises an aim for that motion. To be able to go a thousand miles, he must imagine that something good awaits him at the end of those thousand miles. One must have the prospect of a promised land to have the strength to move. The promised land for the French during their advance had been Moscow. During their retreat, it was their native land but that native land was too far off, and for a man going a thousand miles it is absolutely necessary to set aside his final goal and to say to himself, "'Today I shall get to a place twenty-five miles off, where I shall rest and spend the night.' And during the first day's journey that resting place eclipses his ultimate goal, and attracts all his hopes and desires. And the impulses felt by a single person are always magnified in a crowd. For the French, retreating along the old Smolensk road, the final goal, their native land, was too remote, and their immediate goal was Smolensk, toward which all their desires and hopes, enormously intensified in the mass, urged them on. It was not that they knew that much food and fresh troops awaited them in Smolensk, nor that they were told so. On the contrary, their superior officers, and Napoleon himself, knew that provisions were scarce there. But because this alone could give them strength to move on, and endure their present privations. So both those who knew and those who did not know deceived themselves, and pushed on to Smolensk as to a promised land. Coming out onto the high road, the French fled with surprising energy and unheard of rapidity toward the goal they had fixed on. Besides the common impulse which bound the whole crowd of French into one mass and supplied them with a certain energy, there was another cause binding them together, their great numbers. As with the physical law of gravity, their enormous mass drew the individual human atoms to itself. In their hundreds of thousands they moved like a whole nation. Each of them desired nothing more than to give himself up as a prisoner to escape from all this horror and misery. But on the one hand the force of this common attraction to Smolensk, their goal, drew each of them in the same direction. On the other hand an army corps could not surrender to a company and though the French availed themselves of every convenient opportunity to detach themselves and to surrender on the slightest decent pretext, such pretext did not always occur. Their very numbers and their crowded and swift movement deprived them of that possibility, and rendered it not only difficult but impossible for the Russians to stop this movement, to which the French were directing all their energies. Beyond a certain limit no mechanical disruption of the body could hasten the process of decomposition. A lump of snow cannot be melted instantaneously. There is a certain limit of time in less than which no amount of heat can melt the snow. On the contrary, the greater the heat, the more solidified the remaining snow becomes. Of the Russian commanders, Kutuzov alone understood this. When the flight of the French army along the Smolensk road became well defined, what Konovnitsyn had foreseen on the night of the 11th of October began to occur. The superior officers all wanted to distinguish themselves, to cut off, to seize, to capture, and to overthrow the French, and all clamoured for action. Kutuzov alone used all his power, and such power is very limited in the case of any commander-in-chief, to prevent an attack. He could not tell them what we say now. Why fight? Why block the road, losing our own men, and inhumanly slaughtering unfortunate wretches? What is the use of that? when a third of their army has melted away on the road from Moscow to Vyazma without any battle. But, drawing from his aged wisdom what they could understand, he told them of the Golden Bridge, and they laughed at and slandered him, flinging themselves on, rending and exulting over the dying beast. Ermolov, Milorodovich, Platov, and others in proximity to the French near Vyazma could not resist their desire to cut off and break up two French corps, and by way of reporting their intention to Kutuzov, they sent him a blank sheet of paper in an envelope. And try as Kutuzov might to restrain the troops, our men attacked, trying to bar the road. Infantry regiments, we are told, advanced to the attack with music and with drums beating, and killed and lost thousands of men. But they did not cut off or overthrow anybody, and the French army, closing up more firmly at the danger, continued while steadily melting away, to pursue its fatal path to Smolensk. 
End of chapter 19 End of War and Peace Book 13 by Leo Tolstoy This recording is in the public domain.